the pleasure of, of talking about hazes at the last exoclimbs. And for those of you who were there, I spent most of the time just talking about kind of general um, information about how haze works and about how we think about haze and some of the lessons we've learned um, from the Earth community. Um, in part, that's because at the time there hadn't really been a lot of work um, done on trying to understand haze and exoplanet atmospheres. And I think I, I ended that talk when I went back and looked at my slides with um, this very like optimistic, if we get these proposals funded, we're actually going to do some work. Um, we got the proposals funded, we did the work, and now I found myself suddenly trying to figure out how to talk about all of that in the time allotted. <laughs> um, so things have changed quite a bit um, since the last exoclimbs. I know you all are familiar with how fast paced this field is, um, but I have a lot to tell you about today. Um, first, I just want to start off quickly reminding, maybe, everybody why we care about haze. We've heard it come up a little bit already today. Um, and I'm gonna use the same definition that everyone has been using today, which is when I'm talking about haze, I'm talking about particles produced by photochemistry, um, not talking about clouds. Um, so we care about haze for lots of reasons in planetary atmospheres. I think the one that often comes up in this crowd is that its signal is present in remote sensing observations, sometimes frustratingly. Um, but I'm hopeful, as Caroline mentioned this morning, that we can start thinking about these particles as information rather than frustration that are going to help us figure out how these atmospheres work. Um, we know that they affect the radiation budget of the atmosphere and also the surface if the planet has a surface because particles interact with light differently than gases do. Um, if we have a surface, it's also possible that these particles could be providing a source of organic material to the surface, and that might be an important part of the organic inventory for that world. And so that might have um, important consequences for things like the origin or evolution of life if we're thinking about habit habitability. Um, and one of the things that I also think is really important uh, not to forget is that these particles are a record of the atmosphere and atmospheric processes. By the time a particle ends up on the surface of a planet or in the deep atmosphere of a planet, that particle has experienced every temperature, pressure, uh, background gas mixture, um, exposure to different wavelengths of photons, energetic particles, condensation, transport, all of these particles, all of these processes have affected the particles. And we think that most of those processes should leave their fingerprint on the particles. And so if we can start to really understand how those processes work, we really will have a good record of the atmosphere and atmospheric processes encoded in these particles. Okay. Um, so if you're going to try to understand haze, and I think a lot of you know that I mostly study Titan, or at least I did at some point in my career, um, if you're going to study haze in the solar system, the best place to do it is Titan. But I think that all of the studying of Titan has done us a little bit of disservice, and so I'm going to spend a good chunk of today trying to dissuade you of some of the lessons that we may have learned from Titan because we learned them incorrectly. So this is an image from Voyager as Voyager flew through the Saturn system and beam back this really frustrating image. We were unable to see the surface. Everything okay? No, you can get the lights through. Okay. Well, it's just an orange ball. You're not actually missing anything. <laughs> you're, you're literally missing nothing. Um, a little bit later, you might want to see what's on the slides, but at this moment, see, I told you. <laughs> it's just nothing to see here. Um, so, you know, we knew that it was this hazy world, and Voyager was carrying an infrared spectrometer, and so we were able to get some composition information, and some of these molecules may look familiar to some of you. There's hydrogen cyanide, there's ethane, there's propane, there's acetylene, um, all kinds of carbon-containing molecules. Um, there was only one nitrogen-containing con molecule um, detected by Voyager. That was hydrogen cyanide. All of the other molecules that Voyager found uh, were hydrocarbons, and so... We kind of left the Voyager era of studying Titan with this idea in our head that um, turned out to not be correct. And we've learned a lot from Cassini, but unfortunately some of these, these me messages kind of stuck. And so we left the Voyager era kind of with this idea that organic haze is produced from methane photochemistry in mildly reducing atmospheres. Titan's atmosphere is a mildly reduced atmosphere. Um, and so you will often hear, and I've already heard it said multiple times today, Titan's hydrocarbon haze. Sorry, Caroline. <laughs> She's looking at me like, was it me? Yes, I'm sorry. It wasn't just you, though. Um, so, you know, we came out of the Voyager era with this idea, right? It's hazy. We see hydrocarbons in the gas phase. This, this, this haze must be hydrocarbons. And in the interim, we didn't have the opportunity to get a lot more information about the haze. And so instead, we turned to laboratory experiments tried to try to study the processes that were resulting in haze formation while we were waiting for another mission. And we had to wait quite a number of years. 
And so there were a number of, of nitrogen and methane photochemistry experiments of the type that I'm going to describe um, in excruciating detail here in a few minutes that were designed to try to understand haze formation in Titan's atmosphere. And I want to tell you two important takeaway lessons that we learned from those experiments that turned out to be really important when we started getting Cassini data back. So one thing that we learned from experiments done by multiple groups, um, different, different labs across um, quite a bit of time, is that nitrogen preferentially partitions into the solid phase. And so the vision we got from looking at the gas phase was that the nitrogen wasn't par participating in the chemistry. But that was not correct at all. In fact, the nitrogen is very actively participating in the chemistry. And that's something that we've seen from a lot of data that were taken uh, from the Cassini mass spectrometer. Um, and so one of the reasons we don't see as much of it in the gas phase is because when it participates in the chemistry, it wants to go into the solid. And that's something that we learned from these lab experiments. One of the other things that we learned from these lab experiments is that the presence of molecular nitrogen dramatically increases the production rate of particles in these experiments. If you switch out molecular nitrogen for argon in most of these experiments, you decrease your production rate by orders of magnitude. So the nitrogen is very important. Um, it has a role that it plays in how the energy moves, it drives the chemistry, it's also actively participating in the chemistry itself, partitioning into the salt. So the nitrogen is really important, and we tend to forget about it when we talk about nitrogen, uh, when we talk about Titan's hydrocarbon haze. So I prefer Titan's organic haze, it's a decent description, Titan's very messy haze, Titan's whatever is going on in their haze, I don't know, it's fun. Um, but the reason that I want to dissuade you of this is because carbon, because methane isn't the only important molecule for haze formation, and hydrocarbons are not the only important molecule for haze formation. And I'm going to step you through a bunch of experiments that have shown this, including the work that we've been doing specifically for exoplanets. So I want to show you one more thing that we learned from Titan, because I think it's really important. Um, Cassini was carrying a mass spectrometer that was designed to study the gas phase um, composition of Titan's atmosphere in situ. It had a mass range that went up to 99 AMU. So that's five or six heavy carbon atoms. If this, um, you know, so what we basically thought was that this was what it was going to look like. If we looked at the mass spectrum, so this is, let's see if I can work this without poking an eye out. Um, this is mass to charge on the x-axis. This is number on the y-axis. And so we would assume that this is what a mass spectrum of Titan's upper atmosphere might look like. Six or seven heavy car carbon atoms going up to a mass of 100. In fact, the heaviest molecule that had ever been detected prior to the arrival of Cassini was benzene, just C6H6. It has a mass of 78. Um, so it turns out that we were really lucky because in addition to the mass spectrometer that was very carefully designed to study Titan's atmosphere in great detail, Cassini was also carrying a plasma spectrometer that wasn't meant to study Titan at all. It was meant to characterize the small energetic ions in the Saturnian magnetosphere, things like O+. Um, but they didn't turn it off when it flew through Titan's atmosphere. And then we saw data that looked like this instead. So that's a log axis. So Cassini detected ions, um, in this case negative ions, with a mass to charge up to 10,000 AMU in Titan's atmosphere. That's more like six or seven or eight hundred heavy atoms. Not six or seven, six or seven hundred. So we were wrong by a couple orders of magnitude in our understanding of how complicated the chemistry is in Titan's atmosphere. And this is at an altitude of 950 kilometers above the surface. The mean free path in this region of the atmosphere is about a kilometer. So we're still trying to sort out exactly how one goes about building something that has six or 700 carbon atoms when you barely ever interact with anything. Just to give you a sense of scale for those of you who don't think about chemistry very often, there's our friend benzene, mass of 78. I sat in ChemDraw one day and it took me a full day because uh, programs don't like drawing molecules this big uh, to draw something that is not a real chemistry thing. Um, but that's just to give you a sense of scale of how wrong we were about the complexity. And so um, we had this idea before Cassini that the haze particles form where we see them because that's how it works on Earth. And in Titan's atmosphere, where we really see the particles is deep in the stratosphere. But this is in the ionosphere, and this is where the processes that lead to haze formation on Titan start. And if you look in the ultraviolet in this region of the atmosphere, you can already see that there are particles in the atmosphere that are interacting with light as if they're a particle and not a gas. So this has really changed our understanding of aerosol formation. Um, we thought then, OK, Titan must be this unique unicorn, and it has this really weird chemistry. Um, but it turned out that Cassini had a few more surprises for us. 
So we think that maybe Titan is not the exception and it's possible that it may be the rule for a lot of these types of atmospheres. So this is Saturn now, similar to the spectrum that I showed you a few minutes ago of Titan, you'll see similar molecules. So just to give you a sense of scale of the types of things we're seeing in the gas phase, we see methane, we see ethane, we see acetylene, again, these hydrocarbons. So Cassini's last act uh, was to be intentionally crashed into Saturn. And one of the main goals of the end of mission was send back mass spectral data um, of Saturn's upper atmosphere. And this is what they look like. So we thought, with our understanding of how Saturn worked, that the only things we were going to see were right here, which are hydrogen and helium. That's it. The only thing that we should see in that region of the atmosphere based on our understanding of Saturn. But instead, we see all of these. So that's methane, there's ammonia, there's water. Um, this is Let's see, molecular nitrogen and carbon monoxide. There's CO2. Um, this one over here is benzene. There's potentially some toluene hiding over here. Um, so the chemistry occurring in Saturn's atmosphere is also very complicated. And again, this is at the top of the atmosphere. And so we really had to rethink a lot of our ideas about how these processes work. And so, of course, when these data came back from, from Cassini, um, especially from Titan, we were kind of flummoxed. At the time, I was a photochemical modeler. Um, with my primary expertise being Titan. And we looked at those data and thought, there's no way we can use a photochemical model to figure out what these molecules are. And we wanted to know because we're interested in prebiotic chemistry for Titan. And so we couldn't figure it out from the data. The instrument wasn't designed to do it. We couldn't figure it out from models because models just aren't that good for lots of reasons. Um, and so we started working on some of these questions in the lab. And so all of the experiments that I'm gonna talk to you about and the experiments that I mentioned a few minutes ago all operate on the same principle. We take simple, abundant atmospheric gases, so the main constituents of an atmosphere. For Titan, the experiments are usually molecular nitrogen and methane, maybe some carbon monoxide. Um, if you were doing Venus, you would have CO2 and SO2, the main constituents of the atmosphere. We expose them to an energy source. Um, we can use plasma, you can use UV photons. People have used, if, it, if it's an energy source that exists in a lab, people have used it to do these experiments. These are the two most common at this point. Um, the energy source, source initiates chemistry that often results in the formation of a complex organic solid. Um, and these are the particles that we're interested in trying to study. So we wanna understand this process of how we're converting the gases to particles um, and then everything that happens after that. Um, people often, and I've heard that this word a number of times, especially yesterday, people often refer to this material as solen, uh, which was a term that was coined by Carl Sagan, um, in part because they couldn't come up with an actual word for what they had made. <laughs> um, when people say solen, almost all of the time, and I think every time it came up um, yesterday, you actually mean one specific paper that was published in 1984, this CARI 1984. Um, those experiments were run specifically for Titan, but they were run at room temperature. It's a 90% nitrogen, 10% methane uh, mixture. Uh, the energy source matters less to this audience, but that's actually a, a decent energy source. Um, and on top of that, it was a closed experiment, which is a, not a way that we run experiments anymore. The energy is too high. Um, the only reason that everybody uses this one is because this is the only one that has optical constants over the entire wavelength range that you all want. Um, and so I say this only as a reminder to just not forget what these particles were made for. They weren't made to be used for every atmosphere ever in the universe, uh, in part because we didn't know how many atmospheres there were in 1984. Um, and, uh, but also to say that I understand why people use them and we're trying to fix the situation for you, but it's a little bit slow going. Um, but it is important not to forget this because not all organic gunk is the same. In particular, not all organic gunk has the same optical constant. So that's just a little disclaimer. Um, I'm actually going to, well, no, I'm going to, no, I'm not going to skip this because there's a fun picture at the end. <laughs> um, this is just a schematic of the experiment that we're using to do the exoplanet experiments, just to give you a, a slightly more detailed picture. Um, we can do experiments from 90 to 800 Kelvin. I'm going to show you 800 Kelvin experiments today, um, in addition to the ones that we've published. We have two different energy sources, um, and we can do basically any atmosphere you want. Um, this is what the chamber looks like when it's on. Sorry, Caroline. <laughs> I've never seen someone so excited to see our experiment. I love this picture so much, so I use it in like all of my talks. Um, sorry about that, yeah. <laughs> you can come take another one if you don't like this one, but I think it has to be you at this point. <laughs> um, 
Anyway, that's what the chamber looks like when it's running with the plasma. Um, and then one thing I wanted to do quickly is just tell you, um, a, give you a brief list of the kind of information that we can actually get from laboratory experiments, because I think you know people don't often think about the fact that we can actually do planetary science in the lab. Um, so we can measure the gas phase products of these experiments. I think this is particularly important for this audience because one of the things that we're hoping to do in the long run is we can measure the small gas phase products very precisely. These are things you're going to be able to get if you haven't already gotten them from things like James Webb. We can measure these small gases just like you all will have them too. Um, but then we can measure everything else because we can measure the particles. And so what I'm hoping long run is that we'll actually be able to use the lab experiments to tie your observations together with the, with the information we can measure in the lab. Um, we can look at gas to solid conversion efficiency, which is really important for putting into models. Um, we can measure the composition of the particles. We can measure the particle size distribution. We can measure optical properties. Um, we can measure particle density, which is important for cloud microphysics models. Um, we can measure inner particle forces, which are also important for microphysics. We can look at nucleation efficiency. Um, we can do things like figure out whether or not the particles will interact happily or sadly with the liquids that might be present in the atmosphere. Um, and if you get really excited, like we do for Titan, you can start thinking about things like mechanical properties, because these particles might end up being the sand dunes on the planet that you're interested in. Um, and so those are the kinds of things that lab experiments can provide you. Um, so now I'm going to actually show you some real experiments. And I have to uh, apologize in advance because uh, I made this talk on a Mac. And we had some Mac to PC um, conversion issues. And so some of my slides look like modern art, <laughs> like this one. Um, but I decided that it wasn't worth anybody's time to try to sort it out. I think all the science slides are OK. Um, so one of the, the things that I first kind of started getting interested in was trying to, to step out of our nitrogen methane box. There are so many nitrogen methane experiments, y'all. Like, you have no idea. And so we have spent, like, legitimately, like, 30 or 40 years trying to study how nitrogen methane forms haze and then basically done nothing else because we had this one place that we were super interested in. And so I first got interested in trying to understand what carbon monoxide would do um, because of Titan. Um, but it turns out that Titan isn't the only hazy methane, nitrogen, carbon monoxide atmosphere in the solar system. This is cheating because it's to scale. Um, but that's our friend Titan. This one's Pluto. Um, and this is just here in case some of you have somehow inexpl inexplicably never seen this picture before, um, because everybody needs to see this picture. And so it was for the solar system, these solar system objects that we first got interested in trying to understand carbon monoxide. Um, although as we heard about yesterday, carbon monoxide is a lovely molecule to search for um, in exoplanet atmospheres as well. And so this is something that we need to think about. It's also the first oxygen-containing molecule that really start, we really started studying in these experiments. And as you'll see as I start to talk more about the exoplanet experiments, um, oxygen-bearing molecules have a really important impact on haze formation. And it really depends which molecule we're talking about, what that impact is. Um, so one of the things that we figured out when we started looking at CO is that adding CO to these types of experiments results in an increase in the, in the production rate. Um, this happens for all of the experiments that we did. Um, so we looked at 0.1% methane with a UV source. We looked at 2% methane with a UV source. We switched things up completely and did the same gas mixtures with a plasma instead, um, just to see if that would have any effect. And the answer was really no. The more carbon monoxide we put into the experiment, um, the more particles we got. This was really surprising to a lot of people because we had this idea in our head that oxygen full stop, whatever molecule it was contained in, was bad for haze formation. Um, and that turned out to really not be true. In fact, we have a lot of reasons now why we think that some oxygen, um, depending on what molecule it comes from, might actually be really good for haze formation. I'm going to skip this slide. Um, and it turns out that we could actually look um, and see whether this was from the particles getting bigger, which means that CO makes, um, makes growth more efficient. And it turns out that that's true. The particles get bigger. So adding CO to the gas mixture makes the particles grow more efficiently. Um, but we could also look at the number density. And that tells us something about the nucleation efficiency, that first step of making a particle. And it turns out that CO also increases the nucleation efficiency. And so this trend we were seeing was the result of both things. Um, and it turns out that one of the, the key things, I think, that we have found from doing this work, and it's relevant for all of the exoplanet stuff, is that when we started looking at the gas phase, and the only thing I actually want you to look at in this plot are these um, red diamonds right here. When we started looking at the gas phase, this is molecular hydrogen, that 2 AMU point. 
As we put more CO in the gas mixture, the molecular hydrogen in the gas phase decreases. And we know from some of the work that's been done for Titan that the more molecular hydrogen is present, the less efficient particle formation is. Because every time you break one of those carbon-hydrogen bonds to try to build a bigger molecule, you have the opportunity to run into molecular hydrogen and just reform that bond. So getting rid of the molecular hydrogen is really important to make haze formation more efficient. And having oxygen in the gas mixture that came from that CO seems to be pulling some of that hydrogen out and forming other molecules which helps increase the, the efficiency. Um, one other thing we learned from looking at the solids is that the oxygen actually really participates in the chemistry. And so the more CO we put in the gas mixture, the more oxygen rich the aerosol is. And so this tells us something right away, which is that the optical properties of these particles are almost certainly changing. Their composition is very different. That's gonna affect all of the ways in which they're interacting with the atmosphere. And so this is really important. Um, we also decided to look to see what kinds of oxygen molecules. Um, and since we have some, some astrobiology interest in this crowd, I just thought I would quickly point this out, that we've seen that you can make a lot of molecules of astrobiological interest in the gas phase in experiments that include CO. So these are the five nucleobases that all of life on Earth uh, uses and the two smallest proteinogenic am amino acids, um, ad uh, glycine and alanine. Uh, I'm going to skip that slide. One of the other things we've discovered more recently, which I think is also really relevant to thinking about this issue of where haze formation occurs in different atmospheres, is that we found that the more energetic environment in our lab experiments produces more prebiotic molecules. So these are two different energy sources. One of them is a plasma and one of them is a UV source. Otherwise, the experiments are effectively the same. Um, you can see just from looking at how many things are labeled in this column versus this column that we're seeing a lot more of these molecules when we use the plasma energy source. That energy source is much uh, more analogous to the upper atmosphere of a planet when we're in the ionosphere. And so that's a place for some really interesting chemistry to happen. So just to give you a quick summary about what we learned about CO, the particle size, number density, therefore the total amount of stuff that we made increases when we put CO in the, um, in, in the experiments. It decreases the gas phase molecular hydrogen. I think that's really key to what's happening um, in terms of the production rate. Uh, the aerosols become more oxygen rich as we put more CO in the gas mixture. And we also get some production of some, some molecules of prebiotic interest, which is uh, really interesting and has important implications for the role that haze might play um, in the origin or evolution of life. Um, so after that, we got really excited about exoplanets. This is when everybody was getting excited about exoplanets. So we, um, we couldn't figure out where to start because there's a lot of them. I think you all sympathize with that feeling. Um, and so we decided to focus on this class of planets that we apparently don't have in our solar system, Super Earths and Mini Neptunes. And one of the reasons that we did that, aside from the fact that there's so many of them, is that I wanted to play with new molecules. And so I needed new kinds of planets. Um, and so this is one of the reasons why. The other reason why I think um, many of you know, know and potentially hate um, everyone's favorite problem child, GJ1214b, but it was also the, the period of time when a lot of the super Earths and mini Neptunes that we were able to get observations of were turning up with some type of particle in their atmospheres, whether it was haze or clouds. Um, so we decided to focus on this phase space where we could really look at the effect of a lot of different molecules. So we started with this matrix. Um, we did experiments at 300, 400, and 600 Kelvin at um, 100, 1,000, and 10,000 times solar metallicity, um, which in this audience is probably an okay unit to use, but you can also think of them as being hydrogen rich, water rich, or CO2 rich. Um, we started with equilibrium calculations that were done by Julie Moses. Um, we don't actually yet have good measurements to start from to do these experiments like we do in the solar system. So we thought this was a good, good starting point. Um, and what we found was that we get all kinds of production rates. So the interesting case, well, there's a bunch of interesting cases to me actually, but um, the thousand times metallicity experiments were really interesting to us because of the following thing. This gray line right here is our standard Titan production rate in our experiment. So two of our experiments are actually have a higher production rate than Titan, which was fascinating to us. I don't think we ever in a million years thought any of these gas mixtures would make particles better than Titan makes particles, but we were wrong. Um, one of the things that these two experiments have in common is that they have quite a bit of methane in them, but they also have a lot of water in the gas phase. And so we weren't really sure how water was going to be interacting with the chemistry. It has oxygen in it. 
Um, and we're still working to sort a lot of the details of this out. This didn't really surprise me at all, actually, <laughs> um, in part because we know from the solar system and we know from previous experiments that molecular hydrogen dominated gas mixtures just aren't as efficient at producing haze. We do see particles in our experiment. We also see hazes in Jupiter's atmosphere and Saturn's atmosphere. They're just not great places for doing this type of chemistry because of the hydrogen. Um, this, this over here, I still don't understand. Um, this experiment has no methane in it whatsoever um, and still managed to convert some of the carbon monoxide that was in the gas phase into a solid that contains carbon, which is amazing. And so what I want to, to you to get out of this plot and what I'm going to tell you more as, as we go along is that there are many pathways to making haze. There are many pathways to similar production rates. These, these three experiments have very similar production rates and have completely different chemistry happening. Um, we did the same thing with the UV source. We saw a similar trend. Um, in particular, this 300 Kelvin, 1,000 um, times solar metallicity experiment just really wants to make particles. It's super excited about it. Um, another thing that we found is that the color of the particles actually varies quite a bit depending on what gas mixture we're looking at. Um, I have never, ever seen a lab experiment produce particles of these two colors. Um, we decided that's olive green and this is chocolate brown. I don't know if I'm not feeding my research group enough or what. <laughs> One of my grad students sitting right there, I can't tell she's sh which direction she's shaking her head. <laughs> um, these two experiments with the similar production rate to, to Titan also look suspiciously tight in color. Um, although again, I have to tell you, their composition is completely different. Um, and if you wanna know more about the composition, you should, you should go see Sarah Moran's uh, poster today. Um, and so we know the color varies. Um, we also know that the particle diameter varies, in particular the 10,000 times metallicity experiments like to make much larger particles than we were seeing with the other experiments. Um, and finally, we looked at the gas phase. I promised you we would do that, and we did. This is a very busy plot, so you can just uh, listen to me while I walk you through it for a second. This is all of the experiments I just showed you. So all of the gas mixtures, all the metallicity, both energy sources. And the first thing to see is that in every single experiment, we produce organic molecules in the gas phase, all of them, um, including the one that didn't have any methane in it to begin with. Um, so that was kind of impressive. Um, in quite a few of them, we produced what we have described as prebiotic precursors, um, molecules that the prebiotic chemistry community tends to think of as being important precursors, things like hydrogen cyanide, things like formaldehyde, um, these kind of small organic molecules that can then polymerize or participate in other um, chemistry. And then finally, the things that are stars, we actually produced molecular oxygen in the gas phase. Um, and just to note that in all of those cases, we saw molecular molecular oxygen in the presence of both these prebiotic precursor molecules um, that some people might also think about as biomarkers and organics. Um, and so that's just something that we um, need to think really hard about uh, in terms of our understanding going forward of what, of what atmospheres are capable of. Um, and so just to give you a quick summary of those experiments, um, we found that the water, the water rich or water dominated cases um, produced the most particles, um, Titan like amounts of particles. We know that they're different colors and so we can tell just by looking that they're going to have different, uh, different optical properties. Um, we also know that metallicity and temperature both appear to matter. The way we built this matrix, it's a little hard to think about metallicity and temperature because each of those experiments is self consistent. Um, we had to have the gases in equilibrium to start. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any idea what we were actually uh, irradiating. Um, and so because of that, as you change the metallicity, um, as you change the temperature, you're also changing the gas mixture. As you change the metallicity, you're also changing the gas mixture. And so each of those is a discrete gas mixture. So it's a little hard to study trends. But they both seem to have an effect on what's happening in the um, experiment. And also, we see molecular oxygen and organics produced simultaneously in the gas phase. So this is the matrix that we started with, and this is the one that we have published thus far, um, everything that I just showed you. I'm going to make the following request um, because I want to show you stuff that's new. Uh, I realize this is being broadcast, so it feels a little ridiculous. But also, those of you who are being broadcast, please don't screenshot or tweet about my talk. Thank you. Um, please no pictures. Please no tweeting, and especially no tweets with pictures. Thank you. OK. So we have been doing experiments at 800 Kelvin. Um, these are the gas mixtures for the 800 Kelvin experiments. I'm going to leave you wondering what happened in these two um, and focus entirely on this experiment right here. 
Um, once we got up to 800 Kelvin at 10,000 times solar metallicity equilibrium, there's uh, hydrogen sulfide in the gas mixture. Uh, and so we wanted to find out what happens with sulfur. And so we ran these, uh, this gas mixture that you see right here with H2S with both the plasma and the UV, the way that we've done in the past. Um, but we also did experiments where we swapped out the, hy the hydrogen sulfide with argon, which is inert. It won't do anything just to see what the impact of adding that h bus was on these experiments. So what we find is that the presence of, of hydrogen sulfide increases the particle production rate in both the plasma and the UV. Um, this is a scanning, scanning electron, no, atomic force microscope um, image of the disks that are sitting in the bottom of the chamber that we use for some of our other measurements. Um, you can see with the plasma that the particle size increased pretty dramatically too. Um, with the UV, the particle, the average particle size didn't actually um, change that much, but the size distribution changed quite a bit. And also you can see for yourself, there are way more particles with the H2S than there are without. Uh, I cut off the blank, but a blank uh, disk from our experiment looks like completely flat. There's not a single particle on it. Um, and so the presence of H2S increases the particle production rate. Here's the actual um, measurements, just to give you a sense of how much it's changing. Um, it's pretty substantial, actually. Um, so we're, you know, interested in trying to understand the sulfur chemistry more. Putting that in context of the previous work that we've done, this is the plot I showed you with the original um, nine plasma experiments. And I've now put the, the 800 Kelvin experiment on here in a color that apparently no one can see. Um, it, goes, it goes right up here. Just, it looks, it's at the bottom of the K, if you can't see it. Um, so the interesting thing uh, that I notice now when I look at this plot, having added this additional data point and also knowing what the answer is for these other two cases, um, is that it appears that in the 10,000 times metallicity case, as we increase temperature, we're actually increasing production rate, which is the opposite of what's happening in the other two metallicities. Um, that is almost entirely to do with this addition of these extra gases that we weren't using at the lower temperatures. Um, and I think that's really interesting, and there's a lot more work to do. Um, the presence of hydrogen sulfide doesn't actually um, su substantially affect the total amount of gas-based products, but what it does is it really decreases the amount of molecular oxygen present in the gas phase. Um, and I assume that that's partially, that's in part due to the fact that the sulfur is pulling that out and having it participate in the chemistry. Um, we see all kinds of interesting molecules in the gas phase. Um, we see our favorite uh, precursors, hydrogen cyanide and formaldehyde. We see acetonitrile. Then we see a whole bunch of sulfur containing molecules in the gas phase. So we see um, methyl mercaptan, uh, which is well known for smelling delicious. Um, that was sarcasm for those of you who don't know what mercaptans are. <laughs> um, we see sulfur oxide, we see carbonyl sulfide, we see ethylene sulfide, we see SO2, we see carbon disulfide. Um, we see the sulfur really participating in the gas phase chemistry, um, not seeming to have much of an effect on the organics, uh, but having a huge effect on the amount of molecular oxygen present in the gas phase. Um, so we're still working on uh, trying to understand this and we'll be finishing working up the other two experiments. This paper will hopefully be submitted next week. Um, so those of you who have been dying for sulfur experiments, we finally did one for you. You're welcome. Um, so we found that the presence of hydrogen sulfide increases production rate. Um, the production of gas phase organics is relatively unaffected, but the O2 um, is changing pretty, pretty dramatically. Um, and for the 10,000 times metallicity experiments, the production rate appears to increase as a function of increasing temperature, which we think is the opposite of what's happening with the other two metallicities. Um, and so that just goes to show that the, the composition of the gases in your experiment really matters in terms of what kinds of particles there are um, and how many. But that also shows that there are so many different pathways for haze formation. So real quick, just to say what's next for these experiments, I mentioned that you can go see some of the particle composition results. Um, unfortunately, not the sulfur ones yet. <laughs> the, the rest of the matrix um, uh, is on Sarah's poster, at least the ones that cooperated with our measurement techniques, which was not all of them. Um, <laughs> she's shaking her head, yeah. Um, and then the other thing we're gonna be doing for these is optical constants measurement. So we'll actually do measurements in the UV too, um, but the instrument I'm showing you right here can do, um, optical constants from 400 nanometers to 25 microns. And we're going to be doing the measurements at the temperature that the experiment was run. Um, because we have a cryostat on our instrument that can do from three to 800 Kelvin. 
um, and try explaining to a cryostat company why you want a cryostat that goes from three to 800 Kelvin. Um, I just want to do the whole solar system. Is that too much to ask? Um, and so we'll be doing those at temperature. Hopefully um, that'll be done um, sometime around the beginning of next year. Um, and so we'll have opti optical constants from these particles as well. Um, sorry. So I talked to you about experiments with carbon monoxide. I talked to you about experiments with water, with CO2. And so that's like a good chunk of our oxygen containing molecules, which I was really interested in. Um, but I also wanted to go all the way, all the way to, the, to the edge of the oxidation states. And so um, a couple of years ago, I did some experiments with molecular oxygen. Ray and I collaborated on this paper um, to try to actually think about what was happening in the early Earth. Um, which we heard some a little bit about this morning. Um, but this is also relevant for thinking about extrasolar planets in terms of what might happen um, either in, in atmospheres that have a nascent um, biosphere on their surface uh, or thinking about what happens when you might see the signal of molecular oxygen in an atmosphere. So we wanted to know if haze could exist during the rise of oxygen. So this is an early, early Earth. This is like things have started making oxygen. There's just not a lot of it yet. Um, and part of the reason, again, that, that I was interested in trying to do this is because we have this idea that oxidized atmospheres are less favorable for photochemical haze production. Um, and as I think I've already shown you, not all, all, not all oxygen-bearing molecules are the same. And so we wanted to figure out what happened with O2. This next plot is super complicated, so I'm going to step you through it um, before just throwing the whole thing at you at the end. Um, so this, this set of experiments right here only have methane and nitrogen. There's no oxygen-containing molecules in these experiments. These are the methane um, abundances. And you can see the production rates. They're you know, doing their thing. Um, they're doing a well-known thing, in fact. Um, we know that in the lab, um, with a UV source, which is what we're using, um, that most people see that there's a peak in the aerosol production rate, somewhere around 0.1% methane, before it turns back over. Uh, we think here this is a lack of, of carbon, and so the more you put in, the more particles you get. This is probably to do with the fact that you start having shielding from methane, and so the photons can't participate in the chemistry, can't drive the chemistry as much. So this does what we already knew it would do. So that was good. Then we started adding CO2. Um, and in all cases in these experiments, there is more CO2 in the gas phase than there is methane, except for the experiments that didn't have any CO2. And we see a trend that's been demonstrated before, that when you put CO2 in the gas mixture, unlike CO, you do decrease particle formation. You do decrease the production rate. So those are those points. So now we have only methane and nitrogen. Then we have methane, nitrogen, CO2. And now we're going to add O2 to the gas mixture. Um, and we start with a very small amount, only about two parts per million, um, and went up to 0.2%. Um, interestingly, putting a tiny amount of oxygen in the gas mixture actually makes the production rate go up. I suspect that's to do with this point that I already brought up about oxygen-containing molecules being useful for pulling molecular hydrogen out of the gas phase. Um, and then as we put more molecular oxygen into the gas, um, we had a decrease in production rate, which is probably not surprising because this is what everybody thought all along. But nobody had ever actually done the experiment to show that. Uh, but just to give you a sense of what the production rates look like, this is our standard Titan experiment in that, in that particular setup. So actually, a bunch of these experiments have, have a higher production rate than Titan, which is super, super interesting because, as I mentioned, there's more CO2 in these experiments than there is methane. Um, this is what the lab looked like one of the days that I was doing the experiment. Um, you can see down to the end of the lab, so it's not particularly hazy, <laughs> um, which is good because I spent three years breathing that air for about 10 hours a day. Um, and then just to give you a sense that these are, these are real, we are actually making particles. This is what the gases look like when they ran all the way through the experiment without the energy source on. And so in every single one of these experiments, including the ones that had 0.2% uh, molecular oxygen, we were still making particles in the atmosphere. So I hope the take home message from that is particles, like atmospheres really want to make particles. Like you give gases photons and they want to, they want to convert some of those gases into solid. Um, it's just a question of how much and by which pathways. It turns out a lot of really interesting things happen when we look at these particles too. So um, when we looked at the composition of the particles, we see that the addition of uh, molecular oxygen increases nitrogen fixation. And so all of a sudden, the nitrogen is participating more actively in the solid phase. 
Um, and so we're actually, I see one person really appreciating what I'm saying right now. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe the rest of you are too, but if someone really got what I was about to say. Um, and so what we see in these particles that are produced with molecular oxygen is actually the formation of organic nitrate in the atmosphere from photochemistry. Um, and actually during a period of Earth's history when organic nitrate may have been a useful thing to have raining from the sky. Um, so that's cool. And then one of the other things that I really want to emphasize about um, this work, because I think it's important for this discussion, discussion of optical properties. Um, for those of you who think about NNK, I put this here for you and this here for you. For those of you who don't think about NNK, I'm going to tell you what you are seeing. Um, when we put oxygen into these experiments, even relatively small amounts of oxygen, we converted these brown gunky particles that everyone is familiar with that I already showed you a bunch of pictures of into particles that do not absorb photons, period, end of discussion. Like they are highly reflective, effectively having teeny tiny mirrors floating around in the atmosphere, just with a, the addition of a little bit of molecular oxygen into the gas phase. Um, this is super important for this period of time in early Earth's history, but it's also just to demonstrate that small changes in the composition of the atmosphere can result in huge changes in the optical properties of the particles, which is one of the reasons why we need more optical constants measurements so that you're not all stuck with that one paper from 1984, which I suspect in this audience may actually have been before quite a few of you were born. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I know some of you are laughing uncomfortably. You know it's true. Um, and so just to give you a quick summary of what we learned from the molecular oxygen experiment, um, we know that with relatively small amounts of methane, um, we can produce aerosol in the lab with up to 200 parts per million oxygen present in the gas mixture. Um, in those experiments, not only is there more CO2 present in the gas mixture than methane, there is more O2 present in the gas mixture than methane, and we're still making particles. Um, as the oxygen concentration increases, the aerosol becomes increasingly oxygen and nitrogen rich. Um, and then the addition of oxygen results in an increase in nitrogen fixation, which is cool. So the chemistry is really changing. Um, and finally, the addition of this small amount of O2 results in particles that don't absorb photons, which is super weird. Like, we didn't believe it, so we checked it with another technique just to be sure. Um, and that said the same thing. So I want to go back to this picture that we started with, um, that we kind of came out of this, you know, era of Titan with this idea that organic haze is produced from methane photochemistry in mildly reduced atmospheres. Um, I hope, after telling you about all of those experiments, which I actually got through miraculously, probably because I talked too fast, um, there are many, many pathways for the generation of photochemical hazes. Some of those pathways don't even require there to be methane in the gas mixture to begin with. Um, some of those pathways go against all conventional wisdom that we have ever had about how chemistry works in terms of converting gases into particles. Um, like I said, there appear to be pathways that don't require methane. Um, Oxygen-bearing molecules each play a really unique role in haze formation. Um, I think this is happening for a few different reasons. Um, I think one of the main reasons that it's happening is because if you look at the absorption spectra of oxygen-containing molecules, we've seen a couple of them over the past day and a half, um, they all interact with light very, very differently. And so the fact that they're absorbing photons of different wavelengths really affects how the photochemistry proceeds, um, in part because we need both the short wavelength photons to start the chemistry to break things like molecular nitrogen, which has a triple bond. Um, but we also need the longer wavelength photons to um, keep the chemistry going. So to take things like ethane and acetylene and benzene and break them up and continue the chemistry. So we need, we need all of the photons. We need all the UV photons anyway. I don't care about the visible ones. They can go do whatever they want to do. But I want all the UV photons. Um, and so the, the way in which the, the gases interact with the UV photons really matters. And this is also a really important lesson for thinking about exoplanets because we have all these different kinds of stars, which is really annoying. Um, I'm super excited about it because they're each their own little experiment about what happens when you irradiate with different wavelengths. Um, but that's very hard to replicate in the lab. And so it's something that we have to think about. I think the other reason that the oxygen bearing molecules each do something really different is because once they are fragmented, once they do interact with photons, um, the, the pieces that produced are very different chemically. 
and are going to participate in chemistry in very different ways. Um, one of the reasons that I really want to emphasize the oxygen bearing molecules also is that um, we have a habit, and this happens in the solar system too, of thinking about haze formation in terms of the C to O ratio in the gases. Um, and there's lots of different ways to get specific C to O ratios, um, depending on which oxygen containing molecules you're looking at. And so that probably isn't the best um, metric for thinking about whether or not an atmosphere would be favorable for haze formation. Um, it turns out that oxidized atmospheres may also be favorable for haze formation, depending on other things about them. Um, what is the temperature? What does their star look like? Uh, what other gases are present? Um, like I said, with this hydrogen sulfide experiment, now we're seeing um, that you can have a CO2 dominated atmosphere that's still actually pretty efficient at producing particles because we have this new um, atom in the gas mixture um, that's really good at building things. Um, and finally, one other thing um, to point out, and we had a, a, a discussion about the, the ways in which Earth's atmosphere has, has been up to shenanigans over its history uh, earlier today. But as the planet's atmosphere evolves, its haze will too. Um, and one of the things that we know about planetary atmospheres is that they're constantly evolving over time um, because they are undergoing atmospheric escape, because there may be changes from volcanism or from impacts or all these other things. And so the composition is always changing. And that means that the possibility that there's going to be a haze layer um, present or not will also change over time. And that's something really complicated that we have to think about. So the moral of the story for this um, slide is basically that there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and in part, the reason that there's still so much work to do is that we can't calculate any of these things from first principles. Um, and so we really need a robust experimental and theoretical framework to try to understand how gases convert into particles. And right now, the only place that we really have a good framework for that is Earth. And the reason for that is because the Earth community has spent so much time meticulously figuring out how every gas that matters in Earth's atmosphere interacts with every particle that matters in Earth's atmosphere. Um, I've asked them if they could do it for the rest of the universe, and they kind of rolled their eyes at me. <laughs> but this is kind of, I think, you know, our first baby steps forward into trying to understand bigger picture how haze formation proceeds so that we are able to actually um, bridge this gap that we have between the small molecules that we're pretty good at mo modeling and the particles that are large enough that we can start thinking about them in terms of microphysics rather than chemistry. But there's a huge gap between those, those two things. Um, we haven't solved it in the solar system. We don't know how that works on Titan. Um, I'm hoping that something that is happening soon, see, I was going to sneak it in. You all knew I was going to sneak it in, um, will help us to bridge that gap um, by actually measuring the real particles in a real place. Um, but until then, um, we don't really have that framework anywhere. Um, not just for exoplanets, but also in the solar system. And so it's something that we have to keep in mind um, when we're thinking about haze formation. Uh, and I think I'm almost out of time. Um, oh, well, I, I could tap dance for you. No. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I am good. Um, I would love to take questions. Thank you. Okay, so we have a lot of questions. Uh, so, yeah, you can go. Nathan Main, University of Exeter. Sorry, this is a really basic question about the experimental setup. That's fine. I think I was misled a little bit at one point. So, when you were showing the images of the particles on the surface, when you're forming these things, do they form on the surfaces inside the experiment? Is that acting as a catalyst accelerator no. or is it straight out the gas no. phase? So one of the things that determines um, the pressure in our experiment, which I didn't say, which is a millibar, um, so there you go. Now you know that too. Um, it's trying to make sure that all of the chemistry, all of the molecules as they're participating in chemistry are colliding more often with themselves in the walls. Um, but to also make sure that the particles are actually forming not on the walls, but in the experiment themselves. So it's something that people have spent a lot of time and effort trying to make sure because we don't actually have like giant stainless steel surfaces um, in real atmospheres. Um, but that is something that we have to think about um, quite a bit and do spend a lot of time worrying about. But the particles are made um, effectively in suspension. And that's part of actually what sets their size. So I meant to say this earlier. It came up this morning. I think this morning. I'm trying to lose track of time. I'm a little jet lagged. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that is challenging is that although we're, we're trying very, very hard to mimic the chemical processes correctly, we're not bothering with the physical processes at all. 
And so when we look at the size distributions, one of the things that we're really concerned about with the size distributions is to compare them to other experiments to say, okay, these particles are bigger, these particles are smaller. Um, in a real atmosphere, the particles have the opportunity to stick. Um, they can form larger spherical particles, or they may stick and form these beautiful fractal aggregates that we think are present in Titan's atmosphere. None of that happens in these experiments because we're not giving them a thousand kilometers to fall. Um, I keep asking Hopkins if they could build me a thousand kilometer tall lab and they can't even build me one that functions correctly that has, you know, eight foot ceiling. So, um, but what? <laughs> I couldn't hear what I couldn't hear what I said. Oh, yeah, no, it's fine. I talk about it on Twitter all the time. My lab alarms went off two minutes before we started this talk, so we could go down that road okay, all day. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Um, I wanted to ask you a bit of details on how do you choose the actually choose the gases you put in because you yeah. base yourself on Mosi Setar, but you're showing that things like H2S even as small quantities right. can have a strong effect, but you don't put them on the 100 times metallicity, whereas there is still, yep. should still be some. Absolutely. So that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point. Um, we chose a cutoff for sanity. Um, so the thousand times experiments have like six or seven gases in them, um, which are the most complex experiments of this type that anyone had ever done. Um, we decided that was the most we were going to use. Um, that put us at a 1% mixing ratio cutoff. So we used 1% across the board for all of the experiments. Um, so it's certainly true that in some of those cases, there were gases at like 0.9% that we did not include. Um, so if you look at the 100 times metallicity case, only the lowest temperature has ammonia in it. Um, it's not that there isn't ammonia in those other gas mixtures. It's just that like it was, it's below the 1% level. So one of the things that we're trying to do is figure out how each of these gases matter. Um, now we know that sulfur matters. Uh, and so if we go back through and look at the 10,000 times cases, I think hydrogen sulfide is it's still in those gas mixtures. It's just at a lower level. The thing that I will tell you is the only direction in which this is going to impact the production rate if we start adding those trace gases is to make the production rates higher. Nothing that is lurking below that cutoff is going to make any of these production rates lower. Um, and so that was, you know, that was a choice we made, I think. Depending on what we want to do next, we might be able to go back through and add some of these trace gases in and see, you know, if that would have a big impact um, on some of them. But it was, you know, entirely a choice made for sanity, um, unfortunately. Or fortunately, I'm not sure which. Uh, thanks to, uh, for the dragonfly plug, Sarah. Do you um, want more? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, the conventional wisdom that, that I think I learned um, and maybe it's one of those myths that you've, um, you know, some of the others of which you've, you've been dispelling is that in Titan, the nitrogen nitrogen bond is largely broken by the magnetospheric electrons and the more abundant UV can only break up the CH bonds. Is there anything we've learned from the new horizons encounter with Pluto that challenges or augments that picture? Yeah, so the extreme UV photons can break up molecular nitrogen. Um, in some total, and I have to go back and look at the paper to see what the breakdown is between nitrogen and methane, but in some total, 90% of the chemistry in Titan's atmosphere is driven by UV photons. And only 10% comes from the input of energetic ions of whatever flavor they are um, into the top of the atmosphere. Um, with New Horizons, uh, there, there's still a lot of work to do in terms of trying to, to understand um, exactly what's happening in that atmosphere. There's an ongoing debate about whether the haze particles are very simple and that they're actually just condensates of things like, I don't know, acetylene, um, or whether they are more complicated in the way that we think of, of Titan's atmosphere. Um, my personal feeling is that they're actually very analogous to Titan. Um, in part because the pressures that we're thinking about for Pluto are actually the exact same pressures where we see this chemistry happening on Titan's atmosphere because it happens so high. Uh, and so there's still a lot of work to be done there, but I think there's some, some beautiful comparative planetology um, that is going to be done with the New Horizons data. Um, I'm, we're starting to think more about Triton a little bit too. So I think those three atmospheres are going to be really interesting test cases going forwards in terms of at least trying to see if we can sort out nitrogen CO methane atmosphere haze formation, um, but it's complicated. <laughs>
Thank you for this very beautiful talk. Um, I still remain confused about the particle sizes you are quoting on these bubble plots. Yeah. Um, so at which stage are you are you measuring the particle sizes or which particle sizes? Or you, you gave you gave definite numbers for particle yes. sizes, right? Yeah. So are these the particle sizes on these bubbly surfaces or are these mean particle sizes of a distribution? There. So the so the particle sizes that I showed. So it depends on which experiment I was talking about. Um, but the exoplanet experiments, those are um, disks that are in the chamber. So those are particles that have sedimented out of the experiment and deposited on the chamber, on the on these disks in the chamber. And then we use those disks to do atomic force microscopy. Um, so we measure the particle size distribution. I didn't, sh I probably skipped over one of them very quickly, but we measure the particle size distribution. And then what we were quoting was the mean particle size. Um, but we also look at how the size distribution itself changes because there's information there as well. Uh, two small questions. So, uh, firstly, um, so does this haze form only in the upper levels of the of the Titan's atmosphere? Is it too cold for for the haze to form like close to the surface? Uh, are, are the production rates too too small? That's a really interesting question um, that I don't think we actually know the answer to. Um, we know that the, the chemistry that leads to particle formation starts at the top of the atmosphere. We can see the particles grow. Um, as we look deeper in the atmosphere, they get larger. Um, by the time we get to the top of the stratosphere, top of the stratosphere, middle of the stratosphere, um, we see that the, that the spectra of the particles don't change. And so we interpret that to mean that whatever the dynamical processes are that are happening in the atmosphere, they're overwhelming any possible chemical processes that are happening at that point. And so there's no ke there's chemical difference between about 300 uh, kilometers above the surface and and the data that we get right below the the surface um, But we do think there's physical things happening there. It's a region of the atmosphere where condensation should be occurring So it's a little bit surprising that we don't seem to see the specter change very much um, But to to say where the chemistry starts and stops is is very challenging um, Yeah, and uh, what's the role of ozone in in the haze production experiments? Do you, do you include that does it form? You know? Yeah, um, so in the early Earth experiments, uh, we definitely were making ozone. Uh, I can tell you that because I ended up having to run those experiments four times because ozone is not good um, and it was causing us all kinds of challenges. Um, ozone will certainly uh, start to reverse the process a little bit by scavenging organics and converting them um, back into something smaller. So I think at some point, what starts to happen when we put more and more O2 into these experiments is a combination of two things. One, the oxygen's eating a bunch of the photons that we want to use for particle formation. And two, in doing that, it starts creating a bunch of ozone, which also tamps down the um, production rates. It's hard because um, you can't really measure ozone because it's so reactive and you would need to do it spectroscopically. In that particular setup, we didn't have a way to measure ozone. And so I don't actually have any measurements of the gas composition from those experiments. Yeah. Colin Goldblatt, you Vic. Thank you, Sarah, for a totally rad talk, which changed how I think about hazers. Awesome. <laughs> so, a couple of que a couple of questions that are springing right to mind. The first is for your Neoarchean experiment, you used a quite low CO2, you used 400 ppm. So, what would happen if you use, say, 10,000 ppm of CO2? Um, I think that it would probably follow the trend that we've seen before, um, which is that it would decrease the particle production. Um, but I don't actually know that for sure. And the other thing that is now super important that I should have mentioned when I was talking about the Earth experiments, there was a very important molecule missing from those experiments that nobody ever did any of this chemistry with before until we did the exoplanet experiments. But there is definitely water in that atmosphere. <laughs> um, and we've seen in the exoplanet experiments that the water-dominated experiments have very high production rates. So I would love to go back and redo those early Earth experiments and actually include water in the gas phase. 
um, to see what would happen in terms of haze production there too. So I think if the CO2 was higher, the particle production would go down. Um, but I don't know what would happen if we actually put water into those experiments. Um, the ratios, by the way, were the output of a model that was looking at um, what types of gases we might ex uh, expect to see outgassing from like mid-ocean ridges and volcanoes and stuff like that. So that's why there were very oddly specific um, ratios of gases in those experiments because they were the output of a model. My follow-up question would be, could you describe what you think the history of the haze in Earth has <laughs> atmosphere has been to all of Earth's history? <laughs> Buy me a drink later. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think big picture, you know, I think Earth probably did have a haze layer for a good chunk of its early history. Um, I think that the period of time that you showed today in which the atmosphere is going through all kinds of shenanigans in the gas phase, um, there were probably all kinds of shenanigans going on with the haze layer too. Um, in particular, if we start changing things like optical properties, then you start ch changing the way that the radius balance is working in the atmosphere. There can be a lot of feedback that way, volcanoes erupting. I think that period of time was really unstable. And so I suspect what was happening is that sometimes there was a thicker haze layer and sometimes there was a thinner haze layer. But I'm guessing that it took quite a bit of time before it actually fully dissipated if there was a thick haze layer at the beginning, um, which is not the picture that we tend to think of. People tend to think of it more as a light switch, that once there was any oxygen in the atmosphere, that was it, the haze was gone. And I don't think that's what happened. Hi, uh, my name's RJ and I'm from here. Uh, this question comes from a place of total ignorance. Did you, you said that uh, you, all of the experiments were conducted at one millibar of pressure? Uh, all the exoplanet experiments were at a millibar, yeah. Do, do you expect that varying that would matter at all? Uh, <laughs> yes, that's not an ignorant question at all. Um, so I mentioned that the chemistry starts very high in Titan's atmosphere. Um, that's a very challenging region to access experimentally. Um, we try to have our chamber be many times the, the mean free path of the gases, again, so they're colliding more frequently with each other than the walls. Um, to do that for Titan's atmosphere, we would need a many, many kilometer box. People don't like it when I start talking about filling a many kilometer box with methane and then irradiating it on Earth. <laughs> Maybe someday I'll get a moon base and then I can do the experiments there. Um, so the, the pressure is chosen in part because we know that that is a region of atmospheres where a lot of really interesting chemistry is happening. But it's also chosen in part for reasons that are to do with being practical in a lab. And that's one of the things that's frustrating about lab experiments. And so it's, um, I really appreciated the point that was made this morning about how we really have to work together with experiments and models and observations um, to actually figure out what's going on. Because individually, all of those tools have huge weaknesses and the experiments are no exception. Let's move on and let us thank God for